The PlayStation TV or PS Vita TV as it was known in Japan should have been a slam dunk for Sony. Its goal was simple. A small set-top box device that could compete with the Apple TV and Roku devices with the added bonus of playing Sony PS Vita games and by extension PSP and PlayStation 1 games. The problem was, it didn't do any of these things well at all. Released in 2013, and retailing in North America for $99, there was much early hype about the PlayStation TV, but by 2016 it was completely dead in the water, and you could find them in bargain basement bins at your local Best Buy or Walmart for $40. Myself, like many others, picked up a PlayStation TV on launch. My model is the Japanese region Vita TV, which has no difference at all from the North American release other than the colour scheme being white, which Sony seemed to have a preference in keeping much of its PlayStation hardware in white for Japanese region and in black for North American and European regions. Once I started using my PlayStation TV, I quickly found out that only about 45-50% to of Vita games were supported, and this is because the PlayStation Vita handheld console has a real touchscreen on the back of the unit that does not map over to the PlayStation TV, and many games were blacklisted as a result, with this error message appearing when you attempt to play. And in some cases, games were blacklisted for no real reason at all, I felt like this was laziness on Sony's behalf, or perhaps they were pushing their user base to the PS Vita console instead. In the end, the blacklisting of games on the PlayStation TV could have been addressed better, but like the entire life cycle of the PlayStation TV itself, everything just felt like half measures. Like most of us, I quickly forgot about the PlayStation TV, and it ended up being confined to the bottom of one of my office drawers, never to be used again. So, why are we even talking about the PlayStation TV? Well, there's maybe, just maybe, a reason for you to reach into your drawer and pull out your PS TV and plug it in all over again. You see, there's been a recent development in the PlayStation Vita homebrew scene where there has been an exploit released for firmwares greater than 3.60 to allow homebrew and emulation and unsigned code to run on any PlayStation Vita device out there. And by definition, that also means PlayStation TV. Now, I'm going to go ahead and exploit my PlayStation TV as well as show you some of the choice homebrew and emulators that are available for the system. Let's check it out. So the first thing we need to do is determine what current version of the firmware our PlayStation TV is running. For this, simply go into your system settings and check the system software version. Now to keep this simple, depending on the version that you are running, you will have three different options. If you are running anything less than firmware 3.60, what you will need to do is upgrade your firmware to 3.60 and install what's called the Henkaku exploit. And if you are already running 3.60, you're in luck. The only thing you will need to do is install the Henkaku exploit as before. If you are on anything greater than 3.60, you'll install the newest exploit known as Hencore. Now both Henkaku and Hencore are different exploit methods, but achieve the same end result. For both upgrading your firmware and running the Hencore exploit, I will leave a link in the description below for a comprehensive guide to both of these. Our goal is to exploit the PlayStation TV and to run unsigned code on it. Now since my PS TV is running 3.60, we are going to run the Henkaku exploit. In order to do this, make sure your PS TV is connected to the internet, but if you get prompted to download a newer system update, do not do this. Select the browser application and type in the address henkaku.xyz and then click on the install button. If it was successful, it will boot into an application called Molecule. This program will install the Henkaku exploit onto your PlayStation TV.
Once the exploit is completed, it will automatically kick you back to the menu and you will have a new program installed known as Molecular Shell. This program will allow you to run an FTP server and install unsigned programs to your PlayStation TV. So with the exploit loaded, going into your system settings, you'll see a new settings menu called Henkaku. Select this option and then check the box next to enable unsigned homebrew. Now once you log back into Molecular Shell, you will notice many more partitions that have been made available to the user. The main one that we are interested in is UX0. This is our 8GB memory card that's installed in our PlayStation TV. Pressing select will enable the FTP server and from here we can switch over to a PC and connect to this server and transfer files across. I'm going to install a program called VitaShell as well as Offline Installer. VitaShell is almost identical to Molecular Shell but gets updated more frequently, but essentially they have the same purpose. Now once VitaShell has been FTP'd over to your PlayStation TV, go ahead and browse your UX0 partition and you will see VitaShell.vpk. Go ahead and install it. The Henkaku exploit is a tethered exploit, just like the Nintendo Switch. It needs to push a payload to the device every time the system is rebooted. Therefore, every single time you restart your PlayStation TV, you will need to browse to henkaku.xyz and install the exploit every single time. However, there are two alternatives that you can use. The first is to install a program called enso.vpk, which will permanently apply the Henkaku exploit to your PSTV. Now this program works great for many people and this is their preferred method. The other option, which is what I like to use, is a program called the Offline Installer. What this does is add a mail entry to your inbox that triggers the Henkaku exploit so you don't need to be online to run this exploit. You just need to run the mail app, open the Henkaku email and wait a few seconds and Molecule should load up as normal and install the exploit as before. Earlier I talked about the limitations of playing PS Vita games on the PlayStation TV. Many PS Vita games simply will not run on the PlayStation TV, such as Gravity Rush. By installing a program called Whitelister, it will bypass the system check and allow all PS Vita games to run on the PlayStation TV. You can even emulate the touchscreen on the PS TV by holding down power and selecting the option Use Touch Pointer in Games. This will display visible hand icon cursors that you can use to simulate touch and swipe with the L3 and R3 buttons on a PS3 DualShock controller, or with a PS4 controller, you can use the touchpad. It's important to mention, however, that some PS Vita games rely on touch controls quite heavily and may not provide a great user experience on the PS TV, but at least the whitelister program gives you the option of trying all your Vita games on your PS TV rather than blacklisting a very large percentage of them. One other cool feature of the PlayStation TV is the ability to stream and capture video footage direct from the device. Now, normally you can't do this. When you try to capture a PS Vita TV, you're going to get an error due to HDCP protection that does not allow you to stream or capture any footage from the PS Vita TV device. But there is a way around it by using an HDMI splitter, which is a pretty simple device where you take in an HDMI signal in the input and it splits out to two separate HDMI outputs. And what you essentially want to do is send one of the HDMI signals to your display and the other one to your capture device. Now, it's very important that you only use a splitter that's capable of HDMI 1.3. If you use one that has a higher version than 1.3, it's not going to work. You're going to get the exact same HDCP error. So a device like this, which only costs about 17 bucks on Amazon, is perfect for capturing and streaming your PlayStation TV device. What about playing PSP games? 
Adrenaline is a program that patches the built-in PSP emulation on the PS Vita and PlayStation TV and allows it to run a custom firmware capable PSP. Using Vita Shell or Molecule Shell, FTP Adrenaline over to your PS Vita and install it. You will see a program called Adrenaline Easy Installer. Go ahead and run this. Now inside the Adrenaline Easy Installer app, select Advanced Options and select Install Small PSP Base Game if needed. This option will go ahead and create a dummy PSP game and apply the Adrenaline patches to it. Once that's completed, the PlayStation TV will reboot. So reapply Henkaku via the offline installer if you're not running Enso. Then load the Adrenaline Easy Installer again, and this time select the Install the Latest Adrenaline ECFW Release. This will apply the Adrenaline Custom Firmware to the PSP image that you created previously. Now one feature that's unique to the PlayStation TV over the Vita is the built-in USB port. This allows you to connect up a USB thumb drive and with Vita Shell, you can mount this drive as a device and then map it to UX0. You would do this because of the costs associated with a PlayStation Vita memory card. Instead, you can get a cheap 128GB or 200GB USB flash drive and install a ton of games and ROMs on a single drive. You can also run Adrenaline off a USB flash drive and copy your PSP image files as .iso files and install them into the folder named ISO under the PSPMU folder. Once Adrenaline Custom Firmware has installed, the system will reboot your system again. You will see the icon for Adrenaline. The first time you run this, it will need to install the PSP Custom Firmware onto your memory card or USB drive if you have that mounted. Once that's completed, it will launch the PSP emulator and browsing to the games folder will display the PSP ISO images that you copied to the ISO folder previously. Now you can enjoy playing PSP games on your PS Vita TV. The PS Vita Homebrew and emulation scene is excellent. Installing an application known as the Vita Homebrew Browser, you can browse and install all existing and new homebrew to your PlayStation TV at the push of a button. This really simplifies installing apps to your Vita TV, as in some instances there may be additional setup involved. With some high quality ports of emulators such as RetroArch, you can play many classic arcade games with excellent frame rates. Things aren't perfect however, and there are some slowdowns. I have noticed this depending on the ROM and the core you use, but generally things run quite nicely. There's also a very impressive port of UAE for All, the Amiga emulator that runs very fast and smooth. Here's Turrican 2 running under UAE for All. And of course, things like Super Nintendo is very well represented. All the staples are here. Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, PC Engine, Sega CD, even Commodore 64 runs under RetroArch, and it looks and plays very well. On the homebrew side, things are very nice too. There's been a recent port of OpenGL to the PS Vita which opens up the door for 3D rendering with ports of Quake 3 as well as Half-Life to the PS Vita, complete with 3D rendering. And of course, all these have been tested and work fine on the PlayStation TV.
Now, I've only really scratched the surface with what's available for the homebrew and emulation scene, so if anyone has some good suggestions for things that I should be trying out, please let me know in the comments below. Well, all right, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. Let me know what you thought about the exploit for the PlayStation TV and its homebrew and emulation capabilities. I'd be interested in your thoughts below. What do you think? Is this something that you're thinking about revisiting? Do you have a PlayStation TV that's collecting dust in your house that you may consider pulling out of the drawer and plugging it back in and revisiting? Or do you think it's just a lost cause? Let me know in the comments below. I'd be very interested in your thoughts. Once you do exploit the device and open it up, it does become a very fun piece of equipment to mess around with and play. I've had a lot of fun revisiting my PlayStation TV and I was definitely one of the people that wasn't a huge fan of the device initially when it came out. I just felt like it was too limited and too crippled to do anything useful on the device. So it is definitely, in my opinion, worth revisiting once again and seeing if it really is something that you're interested in going back and taking a look at all over again. Well guys, that will do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this video. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.